Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again this week, and I trust you have been enjoying the program. We are now airing, if this is the first time you've watched it, we are now airing at a new time slot. So if this is the first time you have tuned in, I trust that you will continue to do so. I'm Dr. Lynn Hiles, and of course you know that this program is titled That You Might Have Life. Uh, we have an entire host of materials, if this is the first time you've been watching the program, on our YouTube channel. And uh, uh, you could go back and watch everything we have archived for almost 14 years. We've been on national television, and you can go watch them at your leisure and see some of the former things that we've shared. Um, the easiest way to do that, of course, is to go to my website that is on the screen, lynnhiles.com. In the upper right-hand corner, there are our icons that will take you directly to our YouTube channel, to our podcast, and to our Android uh, audio portion for your uh, Android device. And we encourage you to do that, to watch them, to share them with your friends, to share them on your social media platforms. When you share things like that that are a blessing to you, it helps us to get the word out. So thank you for doing that. Today, I'm going to begin to do uh, a revisit of some things that I did several years ago on the book of Revelation. I'm going to try not to make this too exhaustive, although this is the subject matter that almost everywhere I go, people are asking me questions about it because I think uh, that most people do not realize there are more than one view of the book of Revelation. And uh, when I started to teach this, of course it was not very popular, especially in today's pop culture with uh, a lot of the dispensational type thinking, but what we teach is a fulfilled uh, eschatology on the book of Revelation, and I will show you why if you will give me time and tune in. And so I will try to be meticulous a little bit with this. Probably the book of Revelation is by far one of the most hotly debated uh, books of the Bible. It doesn't have to be. Uh, my per particular stance on this is that uh, I'm not a fighter. I simply will be like Fox News. I'll report, you decide, and then you get to decide. But I think when you start to compare spiritual things with spiritual things, you start to see uh, the revelation of what's unfolding here and that the Bible fits together. For me, uh, eschatology has been one of the most important keys I have ever studied because it will unlock the rest of the Scriptures and it will make it fit in, uh, consistently from Genesis to Revelation as you begin to realize that this is an ongoing continuance of the covenant journey that God has with His people. And uh, the book of Revelation, of course, is the culmination of that redemptive uh, program that God is in the process of doing. Let me just share a little about my journey in coming to understand this. Uh, when I was a young man, I would uh, read things in the Scriptures, probably even when I was in my teenage years. Uh, I would read things in the Scriptures and I would go to pastors and leaders at that time that I was in relationship with and that we were attending their churches, and I would say uh, scriptures that uh, didn't make sense in the context of what they were being written. And I would ask these pastors or leaders, I'd say, well, what about this? And they would say to me, well, be careful now, you're getting deceived. And I'm thinking, well, that's why I've come to ask you so I don't get deceived. But after several years of that, I began to realize these guys don't know themselves, and so they're just giving me a pat answer to keep really from feeling like they don't have any answers. So I decided I was going to get in the Word of God and dig this stuff out for myself. And as I did, I would begin to preach things that uh, would, would uh, catch the ear of people that were listening, say, well, you need to meet this guy because he sounds like you. And then I preached myself into relationship with people 
who were seeing uh, some of the same things. But especially in, you know, the uh, 70s and especially the 1970s in my younger years, uh, there was not a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, there was no internet, of course, so there was no way to research that there was, in fact, other views and ways of looking at the Scripture. As a matter of fact, when I started to discover that the dispensational view of the book of Revelation and of eschatology was only a couple hundred years old, and uh, it is the newest, but it's the most widely embraced, especially in America. But as I travel abroad, I find out that it's not so much uh, embraced around the world as it is uh, in um, the American church. And a lot of the things that made that popular were things like the late great planet Earth and some of those uh, early books and early films that begin to uh, find its way into mainstream Christianity. I don't want to fight anybody. I'm not a fighter. I'm not trying to attack anybody's character. I just think that maybe it would be good for us to look into the Word of God and see what the Word actually says and think for ourselves. A pastor that was recently in one of my eschatology seminars said uh, on, a, fa on a, a social media post, he said, you know, once you see this, you can't unsee it. And so uh, we're going to dig into some of these views that I have, and then you have the, uh, uh, you know, the prerogative, of course, to eat the grapes and spit out the seeds. But as we look at these texts, let us consider the possibility uh, that there may be another way to look at some of these texts. Uh, I think, first of all, the thing that I would say to you is that we read the Word of God, uh, especially as you get into the new, well, any of it, is, uh, we read the Word of God as if it was written, written to us. Now, while it was written for us, it was not written to us. So if you don't get into the mindset of the audience it's written to, you are going to miss what it's really saying. If you don't engulf yourself in the culture of the day, what was the backstory, the who, what, when, where, and why, uh, you're going to miss the points of what is being said to them. For instance, as we get into the book of Revelation, we're going to discover that there are seven churches that are really in Asia. John was not writing to seven mystical ages. He was writing to seven churches that were really in Asia. Now, while we can, uh, of course, draw principles and lessons from what he writes to those churches, we must realize that he was talking to a first century uh, bunch of people who were in a transition from an old covenant paradigm to a new covenant paradigm. And so, I, I, you know, when we delve into this book, let us consider that this book, first of all, uh, is going to have some relevance uh, to a first century group of people. Matter of fact, it's going to have the most relevance. Now, I've done multiple teachings on this, and uh, uh, there are playlists on our YouTube channel uh, with this as a blend of both a fulfilled eschatology and as the idealist or spiritual view of the book of Revelation. I really don't even know what uh, terminology to call it, uh, but it is uh, on my YouTube channel, and it is an extensive and exhaustive study of this. The thing that I'm looking for as I look into this book of Revelation is it starts out in verse Revelation 1, in verse number 1, and it says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now, the first thing I want to say to you is, without uh, any controversy, is that this book is, first of all, and most importantly, a revelation of Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. It is the conclusion of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Now, let me say that to me, as you start through this book, that is the key that unlocks it, because when you get into this book, if you have not studied 
or read the Old Testament, you will not understand that the symbols and the signs, as he writes this book of Revelation, he said, this he sent and signified, literally means he wrote it in signs and in symbols. So he's telling you up front, this is a revelation of Jesus, and it is written in signs and in symbols. Let me be very basic, because this one everybody understands. When you get to Revelation chapter 4, and you see a lamb as if it had been slain, if you have not read the book of Exodus, you will have no clue that that, book, that that lamb is not a barnyard creature running around in a barnyard. It is, in fact, an icon or a picture of what John the Baptist revealed the reality of. When he looked up and saw Jesus coming down over the bank of the Jordan River, he said, right there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we know that uh, that symbol of the Lamb is a picture of Jesus. Well, uh, the rest of the symbols are also in the Scriptures. And we're going to compare spiritual things with spiritual things as we take a look into this book a little bit and try not to be too exhaustive with it. But I want to, uh, I want to, to look at this because it's one of our most sought after things, and especially in the day that we are living in when people's hearts are failing them for fear, and prophecies have failed over and over and over again from many of these guys who are writing the newest book on what, uh, you know, how close the end is near. I'm not trying to be facetious, but I saw somebody uh, had a t-shirt on that said, I've survived at least 16 into the world scenarios. I've been in ministry for over 44 years, and I can tell you that I have seen dates come and go, dates come and go, dates come and go, and at some point I think people want to stop and consider the possibility, just consider the possibility that there may be another way to look at this book that is actually a blessing that when you read it and understand it, and, and the chapter 1 of the book of Revelation tells you that blessed is he uh, that reads and hears and, and understands the words of the prophecy of this book, and then he tells them uh, in the first century, the time is at hand. He was not talking about some future 2,024 years in counting. He was talking in the first chapter about uh, the time being near to those people, and he even uh, makes it even more concise when he said, even those which pierced me will look upon me. He wasn't talking about them being alive in 2,000 years. He was talking about the people who had actually crucified the King of glory, and actually uh, that was in fulfillment of what Jesus prophesied would happen to those religious scribes and Pharisees and apostate Israel. And I believe it was Matthew 23 when He prophesies many woes to them and says, all of these judgments are going to come upon this generation. Not the generation we're living in, the generation that Jesus was talking to right there. And so, uh, we're going to kind of take a look at some of these things, and we will go uh, meticulously to some of it because I think it is incredibly important. And I want to compare it with some things, uh, not only, uh, uh, well, um, I, I want to compare it with some things that are not from USA Today or CNN or the latest Fox News broadcast. We are going to compare spiritual things with spiritual things, and we are going to see that the things that God promised them in the book of Deuteronomy even that would occur in the last days would be fulfilled uh, in the book of Revelation. And we're going to show you the incredible comparisons and show you that the book of Revelation is God keeping His end of the covenant bargain as the children of Israel are coming to the end of an old covenant age. And we will get into some of that as we go. What I want to look at uh, today in introduction to this is to first of all tell you that this is a book that's primarily a revelation of Jesus Christ and His redemptive work. For believers, let me be as clear as I know how to be, for believers, the book of Revelation is about what you have been redeemed from. But for the unbelieving and especially first century Jewish people who had rejected their Messiah, the book of Revelation is about the coming uh, lamentation, mourning, and woe, and catastrophes that would occur within 40 years of Jesus giving 
the prophecy in Matthew 24, and we are going to compare some of those things. Now, uh, uh, let, me, let me hang this on something for you here, because I'm going to read this to you from the uh, complete Jewish Bible. This is the first verse of Revelation, I'm, and I'm reading this from the complete, uh, the CJB, and, and this is Revelation 1. It says, this is the revelation which God gave to Yeshua the Messiah, so that He could show His servants what must happen very soon. And He communicated it by sending His angel to His servant Yohanan, or John, who bore witness of the Word of God and to the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah, as much as he saw. Blessed are the reader and hearers of the words of this prophecy, provided they obey the things written in, for the time is near." Now, what he's telling you, uh, first of all, I want you to see the imminence of this chapter. And we're going to look at a lot of time texts concerning this book, but we will not get to them probably today. What we're going to show you is some comparisons. This is relatively new. When I, did, when I taught my first series that you can find on YouTube, I, I had not seen this translation of... Uh, of the Jewish Bible, but it brought such uh, clarity to some things that I'm sharing that I wanted to share it with you. Now, I've already shared with you that the book of Revelation is first and foremost a revelation of Jesus and His redemptive work. But I also want to show you secondarily that this, this is a revelation that God gave to Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah, so that He could show His servants things which must happen very soon. So, this is a revelation that God gave to Jesus to show them stuff that was about to shortly come to pass, and He sent and signified it then and gave it to His servant John. Now, the th prophecies that Jesus gave and the revelation that God gave to Yeshua were in the four Gospels, or in at least three, or in three of the Gospels, and primarily what I want to focus on is Matthew 24, but then there are other scriptures as well that confirm this throughout the Gospels. Even the parables are dealing with uh, what would, uh, are, are, are literally, many of them are a covenant lawsuit against apostate Israel, and He is in giving them every opportunity to come into the mercy and the new covenant and to receive their King and their Messiah, but they continue to reject their Messiah. And Jesus finally tells them in Matthew 23, woe to you scribes, Pharisees, and He begins to prophesy six woes, and He says to them that all the blood of the slain from the blood of Zacharias to the blood of righteous Abel will come upon that generation that's standing there. And then He weeps and says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and you that kill the prophets, how oft I would have gathered you under my feathers as a hen doth gather her chicks, but you would not. Therefore your house is left to you desolate. And so Jesus is, invite, is telling them, I wanted to bring you under my wings. Now the only place that God has wings that I can find in the Scripture is on the wings of the cherubim over the mercy seat. So when He's saying, I wanted to gather you under my feathers, He's saying to them, I wanted to give you mercy, but you would not. Therefore, your house is left to you desolate. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them, have some form of the Olivet Discourse. They are all uh, fairly close, and some of them deal with more detail. Some of them bring out some things uh, a little clearer than others. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is where Jesus gave the prophecy when He's standing in front of all the beautiful buildings of the temple, and He's telling them, not one stone will be left upon another which will not be thrown down. And uh, He's giving the prophecy of what would happen in those days. And they would ask Jesus the question in Matthew 24 especially, when will these things be? And Jesus answers their question in Matthew 24, verse 34. He's answering their question of when will these things be? When He says in verse number 34, this generation will not pass away until all these things come to pass. So He limits the fulfillment of that prophetic word to within one generation. Jesus gave that prophecy in approximately 30 A.D. and exactly 
40 years later, one generation, everything he prophesied came to pass, and not one stone was left upon another. And you will see that as you go into the book of Revelation, especially towards uh, chapter 11, where the Gentiles are given 42 months to tread the holy city underfoot. That was done by the Romans from 66 to 70 AD, and the destruction of the temple that happened during the time of the seventh trumpet uh, in response to the prayers of the martyrs who were saying, how long till thou dost avenge us? Uh, from the blood. And Jesus said, just a little while until those who should be killed will be killed. But that finally comes to an end in the, in the 11th chapter of Revelation during the last trumpet that sounds on the heels of the destruction of Jerusalem in about 70 AD. And uh, so he is telling them that all of the, and, and, and that connects as well with uh, the prophecy of Matthew 23, that upon you will come the blood of all that were slain and the martyrs were slain on the earth in Matthew 23. And the response of the destruction of that city is found in Revelation chapter 11 in response to the prayers of the martyrs saying, how long, Lord, till you avenge us? Now, uh, Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse, uh, he will say in Luke, I believe it is chapter 17, I don't have all of those scriptures in front of me because I'm doing an introduction right now, but in Luke 17, he says these, as he prophesies the same uh, Olivet Discourse, the destruction of the temple, the great tribulation, all of the things that would occur within that generation, he said, because these are the days of vengeance, that all things that were written might be fulfilled. And Jesus fulfills all of that within, uh, or, or all of that prophetic word is fulfilled within that 40-year uh, transition period from 30 AD to 70 AD in fulfillment of the revelation that God gave to Yeshua, the things which must shortly come to pass. And I'm going to show you as we look at the Olivet Discourse and as we look at the book of Matthew, chapter 24 especially, that the prophetic word that he gives and declares, like there will be wars and rumors of wars, there will be earthquakes, there will be famines, there will be death and hell, the, the stars, uh, the moon will be, uh, or the uh, sun will be dark and the moon will be blood, uh, turned to blood and the stars will fall from heaven. All of those prophetic words, if you read that in Matthew 24, and then you come to Revelation chapter number 5 and chapter 6, you see that every seal that is open is in uh, direct fulfillment of those prophecies, whether it's the first horse that comes out, conquering and to conquer, wars and rumors of wars, whether it is a great famine that you see a measure of wheat for a penny under one of the horses, or whether you see death and hell that follow on uh, the, uh, uh, the green horse, actually it's green in the Greek, but it's the, it's the uh, spotted horse or the speckled horse. Then you see as you come on down through those, uh, uh, those, those, those prophetic things in the book of Revelation, how that uh, they will go and get in the mountains and hide in the dens and caves of the rock and, and say, hide us from the face of the Lamb, for the, uh, the, 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 the wrath of the Lamb has come. And you see them as fulfillments of the prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew 24 and Mark's gospel and in Luke's gospel. The thing that I think is unique is that John's gospel, the gospel according to John, does not have the Olivet Discourse. It does not have that same prophecy concerning the end of the age. Uh, King James calls it the end of the world, but the, that's a bad translation, and New King James corrects it when it says, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the uh, world is what the original King James says, but every translation corrects that from there on and says not, not the end of the world, and this is a game changer because it's not the end of the world, it was the end of the age. It was not the end of this age, it was the end of the old covenant age, and hence it was the beginning of a brand new day, and it was to them in that first century, uh, the book of Revelation is declared to be the great and terrible day of the Lord. So for believers, it was a great day because it's what you've been redeemed from and their redemption was drawing nigh. And their redemption was not a flight out of here. 
It was a redemption from the curse of the law and a redemption from uh, the events that were about to take place within that generation. And uh, those that heard the words of Jesus and heeded what the prophecy that gave, God gave to Yeshua to show them things which must shortly come to pass. The people that heard Jesus say, when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, you will know that it's near even at the door. And as you come into the book of Revelation, chapter especially especially number 12, you will see that they flee into the wilderness for 42 months, three and a half years, times, times, and a half a time, or the full amount of time which the Jewish war from 66 to 70 AD was fought, and the believers who believed what Jesus had to say fled the city and were spared from the curses that were coming upon that city. And I will show you how that in the book of Revelation, these curses that come are in fulfillment of the Deuteronomy curses that the children of Israel had called upon themselves when they called heaven and earth to witness against them, that you will see that if you read these curses and lay them over the book of Revelation, that they are all the plagues that you see in Egypt and all the plagues that God told them would come upon them because He tells Moses in his final final days, these people, after you die, are going to go whoring after other gods, and all of these plagues are going to come upon them, and he tells Moses it will happen in the latter days. Now, once again, it's not the latter days of this age. It was the latter days of the Old Covenant age. And so this book of Revelation is a revelation that God gave to Jesus to show His servants things which must shortly come to pass. And then He gives it to His servant John, and John is writing this expanded version, if you will, of the book of Revelation as a fulfillment, I believe, of the Olivet Discourses and God's keeping His end of the covenant bargain to bring upon apostate Israel all the curses that were written in the book of the law. Now, the reason I don't believe these things can occur again is because we are not under that covenant it, and we are no longer under the law. We are singing a new song, Thou hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every nation, kindred, and tongue, and You are worthy. So for us, it's what we've been redeemed from. It is a great and terrible day of the Lord, and we are going to make some of these comparisons. Perhaps in the next segment, I will show you some time texts that keep reiterating that the things that were about to occur were about to shortly come to pass within that first generation in the first century. And I will show you from multiple scriptures where they are uh, talking about the imminence of that day coming. Well, we're about to run out of time for this segment, but I'd like for you to join us every week as we continue to unpack this. I'm going to try not to make this too exhaustive, but who knows? We, we are going to talk about it. But if this is the first time you've watched this, please tune in again uh, at the same time. If you'd like to become a partner with our ministry, the easiest way to do that is to go to the website there, and there is a link where you can give through our PayPal portal via your credit card or debit card. Uh, you can set up a monthly debit if you'd like to become a monthly partner. You can also send a check or money order to the address that will come on the screen or you can call the phone number that will come up on the screen. Someone will take your call. If you don't get an answer, leave a message, and we will return your call. We do have a limited staff. So God bless you. Join us again next week at the same time. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.